Hello and welcome to another episode of Metal Effort. My name is Nehemiah and today we're going to be looking at this piece of metal, the Medford Derhoon. This is kind of an experiment for me. I'm going to review a knife that I normally would not be attracted to. Just Medford knives, overbuilt, beefy knives are not really my cup of tea. And so to kind of practice my reviewing skills, see just how difficult it is for me to remain biased, I wanted to pick up this new model that he came out with and give it a shot. It is a much smaller knife than he normally makes. And so maybe, you know, if I'm going to like a Medford, this would be the one that would have the best shot at, at winning me over. So this was a very interesting review for me. Uh, it ended up being much more philosophical than I thought it was going to be. And so make sure you stick around to the conclusion because we're really going to have to dissect what this knife means, not just how good it is, which we'll obviously go over. Let's do our size comparison. This is uh, immediately uh, being dwarfed by our PM2 and our Para 3. Uh, the blade length on this guy is pretty small. So uh, get a quick measurement in here. We're looking at that, like 2.25 inches uh and then cutting edge we're looking at like 1.75 maybe 1.8 ish of actual cutting edge it's a pretty small knife and i've been re reviewing a lot of these small big knives lately i reviewed the half track by hinderer i also gave a pretty favorable review to the new we knives roxy which is you know much bigger than this knife but still kind of in that category of a a small big knife and you know it's not something I was really into until recently I'm trying to just get a, a bearing for what kind of knives what kind of you know shapes and sizes really appeal to me both in a practical sense which is my primary you know attribute I'm looking for but also just does it connect to me on some kind of irrational emotional level and you know so far I've got one I find really appealing uh, surprisingly so the half track is, <laughs> ironically, kind of in the middle. It's, it's I'm half in love with it, half not. And then we've got our Medford, which we'll see how this all shakes out soon. Uh, before we jump into the dent, let's do a quick weigh in. Just over three ounces. That isn't the best ratio for like blade length to weight, but still, objectively, three ounces is not very much. So I don't think it's going to be a problem for most people. It's more awkwardly shaped in the sense that it's just so square-ish uh, in your pocket. You, you definitely gives you a lot of space in your in the bottom of your pocket because it's just not very long. All right, so let's get into the dent, the decent, the excellent, the nitpicks, and the terrible of this piece of metal. First off in the decent is just this geometry of the blade and the uh, knife overall, just the size of it. I find this to be pretty easy to EDC. Uh, it is kind of wide, but really when you get down to it, it's not that much wider than, you know, like a pair of three. You know, it's, it's if we compare it at its thickest point, it's thinner, but overall the average thickness is probably more than this area. I didn't find it to be a problem. You don't have a flipper tab or anything hanging off of it, so it wasn't too too much trouble to get in and out of the pocket. It carries pretty well in that in that regard. Uh, and then because of the finger twirl here, you know, it, it's still a functional blade. You're getting about three and a half fingers on there. I have medium sized hands. And so even though it's a tiny little knife, it, it works. You know, you're not going to be popping this knife out of your pocket for like all day, every day cutting. Just, uh, you know, open up a box here, cut tape there, whatever. It, it, it's like a glorified box cutter in terms of like its utility. It perfectly functional, it does the job in that way. Next thing I'll talk about is the blade. Now, first off, this is S35EN. Uh, it's not like, you know, M390 level or anything like that. It's not the highest of high, you know, premium steels, but it's still considered a, a super steel. And Chris Reeve has been using it for a long time and it, it's good, it's definitely proven itself. It, it's not necessarily living up to the hype before it came out. We thought it was going to just be strictly better than S30V, where we're finding if, you know, they're both equally heat treated correctly, they're not that far off from each other. Uh, but still, it, it's better than what he was using. 
I, I discovered this after the fact, but for the longest time, Medford was just using D2 Steel, which is crazy <laughs> considering the price. But S35VN makes it a little bit easier to to kind of swallow this price. It's um, good steel, not great. Like for this cost, I want a better steel, but I'm not. It's not a bad steel, obviously. The blade shape itself is pretty unique, actually. So it's a very tall grind even though you know just kind of a saber grind of how how tall that grind actually is it's tall even though it's starting halfway down the knife they you get a lot of distance between you know the tang of the blade and where the grind actually starts and you're starting off from pretty thin i mean it's thinner than the thickest point on the pm uh, pair three rather but more importantly it's a very hollow grind Let's see if i can catch this, this is kind of hard to see maybe we'll just look at the actual grind line right here so very hollowed out it actually slices pretty good you know if you're doing not deep cuts but just cutting something that's you know an inch or less thick this does great cuts right into it you got a lot to move up and over past you know with the fuller there uh and just how much material this you know is providing like friction so like cutting cheese or something would really suck on this and it's not even long enough to like get through a block of cheese so it has its limited applications in its geometry but as far as the actual cut itself go goes uh the th thinness behind the edge the blade stock i think it's it's better than your average medford uh, maybe question mark uh so it, i'm putting it in the decent because i was surprised i was expecting terrible cutting power and this was like just over the hump of decent and so i'll call it out here next thing i'll talk about is the clip the clip placement i there's aspects to this clip i like and i don't like but calling out the positives here it's reasonably deep carry it it starts you know at the top here i think they could have ground this back you know you have the screw back here i think you could have shaved off some of the extra material between uh, where your your pants are going to be sitting at the top of it up to that screw i think he could have shaved off a little bit more to make it a little bit more deep carry uh, but it's definitely not as atrocious as some of the clips are it's extremely long you know it's covering like two-thirds of the length of the knife when it's closed so no no fear of it popping out of your pocket normally in terms of just length um i don't hate the mkt um but I don't need it. Uh, the flame anodization is really nice. He doesn't do it on all the models, but I think this added a little bit of flair, uh, so I picked this one. But, uh, you know, it's okay. Maybe a little bit of above average. We'll talk more about the clip later, um, but I'll try to be positive where I can be. And this is kind of a very specific and weird thing to call out here, but... I like the sound it makes when it opens. Uh, I'll try to get this here. It's a nice snappy sound to it. Um, this uh, serves no practical purpose whatsoever, but I like it when it when it makes a little snappy sound when you disengage it or engage it rather. Um, okay, on to the excellent and. I've got a couple things to talk about here. First thing in the excellent is the presentation. This is the box that the knife came in. A uh, little container. You got a little dog tag thing here. 100% made in USA. His phone number, um, his website. And then pretty nice sticker on here. It's got some depth to it reflective uh, looks very professional again USA website MKT a little M and a K are sharing the same spine okay okay so we open this up and then you got this nice padded little pelican type case you have some rubber ceiling so I imagine this might be like water resistant and then you've got this nice little thing here limited warranty care and maintenance kind of giving you some advice on how to care for it he gives goes over the three different kinds of steel that he uses and how you should treat them differently a little signature the birthday 
Okay, and then uh, inside that is a little card. 100% uh, American made. Anytime, anywhere. Okay, so what I'm getting at here is that the presentation of the knife is pretty stellar. I think of any knife I've ever purchased, this is going through the most effort to kind of convey some semblance of like quality. So basically, I think what we should take away from this is just the time and attention and care put into the experience of owning this knife. You know, I could I can put this in one of my 13 knife pouches if I needed to put it somewhere in between use, right? We all have extra ones lying around. We don't need this case, but it's nice when knife makers go the extra mile and give you something like this, right? And I, the case especially, you know, that that's nice. You know, I'd have to go out of my way to get a case like this. And it's, it's, it's a little cherry on the top, right? And it makes you feel good about your purchase. You know, if you're nervous opening the knife uh, for the first time and you see this much attention to detail just on the packaging and the, the certificate of authenticity and all that, it, it might, you know, subside your fears a little bit, at least temporarily. This leads me into my second excellent point, and that is how this knife is marketed. Now, I don't know if I want to show you a website. I mean, you can just go to his website. You, 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 got, you got that on here, here. Yep, there you go. Uh, go to his website. Check it out, and you can see what I mean. Uh, this is, like, perfect marketing. I think, I don't know if this is something that Greg Medford stumbled into or carefully considered beforehand or just developed as he went. I don't know where his, like, headspace was. But just objectively looking at the marketing of this knife, I think it is stellar. This is like the the Monster Energy drink or the Rolex of watches in terms of marketing for the knife community. It, it's just so oozing with a style and a target audience and it's executed expertly to reach a very specific demographic, okay? Not saying that this knife can uh, uh, appeal to many different people. This is less about the target audience themselves and what they're like. Just the idea that's being targeted. The, you know, chemical makeup of our brain of, you know, through evolution <laughs> of something feeling sturdy or durable or trustworthy or, uh, you know, industrial there's something here and just to give you an example of kind of how this is conveyed you have a giant serial number in your your fuller here you have one on this slab on the outside of the knife you have one on this slab on the outside of the knife you know a lot of knife makers mark their their components um keep track of it when they're when they're assembling the knife obviously a lot of the time though these type of things are stored internally. And I think this is a very deliberate decision to have it on the outside, right? You know, if the slab is not connected to the knife, it'd be just as easy to etch that into either side, right? So why is it that this is on the outside? And it's because you might think of a gun or some kind of grenade or you know, military kind of background, you know, he, he's a self-proclaimed jarhead, you know, the, the, the idea of like, um, military grade, uh, something that is, you know, designed and tested battle hardened that, oh man, I don't want some, some wimpy Nancy knife, you know, made for, for cutting open boxes. I want something that the, you know, military uses. Okay, um, that's interesting marketing, you know, and sometimes people embrace the tactical side of it of like it's designed for cutting people or damaging people or whatever. I think this is much more subtle. It's not just speed holes and 
very sharp pointy tips it's it's not assisted opening this is appealing to a different part of our kind of carnal nature of like big thick beefy knives that implies that you can be really rough on it you know it's like the humvee of of knives where sure it doesn't have great gra gas mileage it's not aerodynamic um but it's it's super durable you know you could drive it drive it around the desert and uh, you're not going to have a problem, you know. That That's what's being implied here. By doing these things, the way it's marketed, the Pelican case reminds you of like a gun case. The dog tag obviously is hearkening back to military. The kind of shapes and, and things that I'm, I've noticed him kind of design into his knives also remind me a little bit of like Halo. Like the video game, you know, Halo 1, Halo 2, or something like that, which, you know, people that were playing that as, like, teenagers back, you know, 15 years ago, they would be, you know, right at the, the age where they have disposable incomes. They're maybe back from their tours and, and some kind of military stint. Um, you know, the, a lot of those people, this is being a little bit stereotypical, but I think there's some truth into it, of, like, you know... <laughs> jarheads playing video games uh you know space marines kind of aspect of it <laughs> this seems very much like a, a cross between a halo covenant or a umc uh type type weapon or tool crossed with like a, a military you know knife from like the american service you know and so this is so very neatly packaged, both li literally and figuratively, of stellar marketing. And we're going to go into our nitpicks. So let's talk about these fullers. These fullers are going to catch, you know, skin on the edges and stuff. Those are pretty easy to clean out with a, you know, Q-tip or something. If you got a bunch of human remains kind of gunked up in your, your fuller, you can wipe that out pretty easy. But when you put your serial number right into that... That gunk is going to get into your digits here, and it's going to be much more difficult to, to get out. And it's kind of frustrating because you have the same problem here, and you have the same problem here. Gunk is just going to get up and in those letters, numbers. Am I crazy? This knife is giving me a brain aneurysm. All right, so next thing I want to talk about is the tang of the blade, when the knife is close, is actually exposed. I don't know if this is an actual issue or not. But I could see, you know, if you dropped your knife, let's say, and it landed right on that, you know, just from random chance or, I don't know, if this got dented, which would be much easier to do because it's so exposed, that is the most important part of the knife in terms of good, safe, solid lockup. You know, if you got a big dent in that, that face, your lock bar might not make connection with it near as well, and you might not have the same level of lockup. Um, I don't know how often that's going to actually happen, but it's just awkward, if anything. You know, from a visual standpoint, it's just weird that you got this little little hump out here. It looks like it's a design flaw or you know, fit and finish problem, when obviously it's meant to be like this. Uh, once you actually get close, there's no other way it could be, but it's just by virtue of having the pivot so far back on the tang of the blade, this is kind of the issue that you're going to have. There's a separate nitpick that kind of bleeds into this, and that's the exposed detent track. Now, some people get bothered by this quite a lot. I definitely agree that it makes the knife look worse. It's just kind of messy and dirty. You want to have a little bit of, like, you know, grease or something in the detent track sometimes. And if that's the case, it's just going to be really easy for that to get, you know, smudged and removed. So you're going to maybe have to loop that up a little bit more often. If you're cutting into food, obviously, you're going to get some gunk in there. If you're not careful, um, it's just kind of awkward. Not a big deal. Again, this is in my nitpicks. Uh, but it, it, it's a thing. It's there. It, it's something you should know. The last nitpick I have is this lanyard hole. It doesn't go through all the way on the both sides of the knife. It's only on the presentation side scale. And it's kind of weird. Again, I... I it's so close to the blade, it's going to be hard to see this, but when you have it not loop through, when you have it loop through on both sides, 
that makes it more difficult for the lanyard hole to get tucked in to where it's in the like path of the blade. But when it's only on one side, it'd be very easy, you know, if you had a lanyard hole out here and there's any kind of force this way on the lanyard hole, it could get pushed into the cutting path of the blade. And so if you didn't notice, you know, if your lanyard hole has got like shoved in while you're using it and then you don't properly pull it out before you close, I could see it nip in the lanyard. Uh, not a big deal. It's just, I don't know. It's kind of asymmetrical. I don't, I don't know. It's just not doing it for me. I feel like if you're going to not punch through on this side of the scale and you're just going to have an obvious triangle on this side, just don't even bother putting one on there. It's, it's kind of weird. All right, let's get into the terrible. And for this, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to go through our OCD open, close, disengage. These are the three aspects of action that I like to kind of zoom in on and nitpick. Here, we'll, we'll start with the opening. It's kind of awkward because you, if you're going to open it one-handed, you have to do this very specific thing that you, you kind of train yourself. If you just try with just your thumb on this side and open it, the D10 is too strong. You can't really do it. Like, you know, I'm clearing, so no pressure on the lock bar. You really have to concentrate to get it open. It's very awkward and slow. I feel like I'm going to drop the knife. To be consistent and somewhat quick, you develop this like pinch grip where these two fingers are holding the, the clip and then you're, you're using your pinch just to release the tension of the, the detent and then your, your thumb can open it up the rest of the way, kind of like a Sabenza rollout. It, once you get used to it, it, it's fine. It's okay. I hate it. I, this sucks. I, I do not want to open. I feel like I have old lady, like, claw hands. Like, I, 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 ugh, that's weird. Next thing, we'll talk about the disengage. So, there, I cannot tell for sure, but I don't think there's a steel lock bar interface. Insert. I think it's just raw titanium, which is fine. You know, that that's on like the Spidey Chef. I That's not a part of the nitpick necessarily. The one thing I will say is it's not like the easiest disengage ever. You have this side is chamfered, but on the, on the clip side scale, right? On the lock bar. But on the show side, you have these like decorative grooves, cutouts to make it look like a halo knife. And so you wouldn't have enough material to do the same thing on the inside of this knife maybe i'm assuming because he didn't do it on this side on the presentation side and so the actual thickness you know if you can see my thumb trying to squeeze in there is actually pretty awkward and they are flush it's not like this could just you know if it looped down a little bit to where i can come in horizontally this way and and grab that little ledge the disengaging would be a lot easier but instead i'm just kind of mashing my finger in there and then moving it over and it's i wouldn't say outright painful but it's it's not fun uh it's not intuitive it's not quick it's not reliable um it just makes me not want to open the knife doesn't make me want to disengage the knife you know if this is the only knife i have like i would use it for when i need a knife to try to cut things but nothing about this makes me want to use it Finally, close. So, taking the blade, it's, you know, washers, little tiny blade. It's, you know, five or six jostles to get it closed. This is something I'm, in my mind, treating as a slip joint that you have to unlock first, frustratingly. Uh, I think I would just prefer, like, a DeVere's style uh knife here for like a slip joint i think would just be easier than this it's that complicated slow and awkward so you know i'm giving the open the close the disengage they're all like less than five out of ten for the experience i'm not going to tell you how far i would go on each of those but just know it's terrible the average on this is bleh. if you're a fidgeter do not get this knife it is anti-fidget friendly next terrible thing is I'm going to say er ergonomics, but specifically it's this corner right here. It looks innocent. And it's like chamfered on this side, but not on this side of that surface. 
So all this chamfer did is make this pokey part more pokey. It is immediate jolt right in your skin. And so every time you grip it, you have to be careful when you're going for the lock bar that you don't brush up against it, or when you're holding it that you don't go this way at all, because that will grab into your skin and poke you real good. I, I'm frustrated. I could just take a file and file it down, but obviously I'm ru ruining the anno job. And it's just like an unfinished knife. Like, most of the other parts of the knife are properly chamfered. Why would you not take the time? Like, it's like a huge ledge. It would just like, shoot, shoot, shoot. It'd take you two seconds to do that, man. Like, I don't, why? <sighs> Next terrible thing, proprietary screws. Uh, this is really, really frustrating. I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can imagine all the reasons. I'd like to get in there. I'd like to lube it. I'd like to be able to surface it. Um, you can't do anything. You gotta, you gotta send it to him if you want any work done. Uh, that's pretty frustrating, for obvious reasons. Last terrible thing is the price. This is four hundred and sixty dollars. That's the cheapest. I think maybe four fifty is like the cheapest one that he makes of this. He has different finishes that go up for a little bit more expensive. Um, this one particular one was four sixty. Now. Price price is really subjective, and it's really hard to put your finger on if something is worth it, right? And I'm really frustrated by this knife because there's a lot of things that don't appeal to me. You know, I go over the open, close, disengage. I want something out of those three. I want, I, I ideally two of those things need to be good for me to even consider keeping a knife. Um, you know, sure. You could, you could put a little passive-aggressive line saying that these aren't fidget toys. Okay, you know, that's fine, except for there's knives that are better cutters, that are more durable, that are easier to maintain, and are fidget toys. So if you're going to make a knife that's not a fidget toy, then you need to be knocking everything else out of the park. <laughs> All right? And so... The maintenance on this knife on the outside is increased. I don't even get to touch the inside of the knife. And as far as, like, a knife goes, you know, is this really worth $460? No, I don't think it's worth $460. My conclusion is this. I think both the people that buy the, these knives and Greg, maybe himself, what if we just, like, dropped the pretense what if for like a year, Greg, you just made knives based on how good they actually are? Like make a knife, earn its pay. This is titanium, this is steel. We know the components it's made out of. That alone does not demand $450 US, right? Regardless of where you get your money, whether you live here or not, $450 is $450. Make a knife that earns that without the marketing, without the branding that serves no actual purpose. Customers, us, knife buyers, let's experiment and reward knife makers that are achieving both form and function and charging a reasonable price regardless of what country they happen to live in. Let's experiment with the idea that all humans are equal, regardless of what country you were born in or currently reside in. Let's go with the idea that we want to make the knife community bigger. We want the knife community to be inclusive of all types of people from all walks of life with all sorts of different political stances. I think in order for the knife community to grow, and be more inclusive, we have to get rid of these stigmas that are attached with the knife community. Murder, tactical, uh, military, all these types of things are negatively associated in the public's mind's eye. And I think the more we latch on to the military side of it, the tactical side of it, the more the opposite end entrenches itself in its negative view and perception 
of somebody that's into pocket knives. I want to change that perception. In order to do that, we need to be more mindful as both consumers and knife makers to not fall into that trap, to not fall into that that pit of something that transcends functionality and is just art, <laughs> tactical, violent art. And I think we can do better. I think we can be more inclusive. I think we can grow the community by reaching people that normally wouldn't be in this hobby. We don't have to we don't have to censor ourselves. I don't blame companies for making knives that appeal to people. And right now, the zeitgeist of the vast majority of knife buyers are looking for the tactical side of things. They don't know any better. They don't know there's a different culture that is starting to gain a bigger foothold in the community. Normal people, and I don't mean normal as in what they look like or where they're from. I mean reasonable non-murderers. <laughs> like people that aren't concerned with stabbing people with a knife. People that understand that the vast majority of needs of an edge like tool is to cut into boxes or cut food or do basic things that doesn't require silence or 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 a tactical advantage if we can kind of shed ourselves of those stigmas i think the general public would be more open to laws that are more positive for knife you know owners and and you know us as enthusiast hobbyists i think how we buy and make purchasing decisions affects what makers make and what kinds of knives they're marketing right you look at the names of the knives that, you know, Greg Medford and others make, you know, like Matanzas is like the word for slaughter. Like there's certain, you know, broken skull. Like there's this marketing that is very effective. So it's not the company's fault 100%. They're, they're just following the money. So, you know, something has to break that cycle. Either... Us as the, the consumer needs to start demanding different kinds of knives that don't focus on that and or people making the knives, individual knife makers especially, need to make knives that are really good functional tools that are also appealing. Think Apple and less Smith & Wesson. <laughs> There's a different direction we can go and one that is just more inclusive, more practical, makes more sense. And so this is a team operation. I need makers and I need the community, the, the, the people buying knives to change their habits so that we can draw in more people, have better laws, and start to take advantage of the awesome steel and creativity that people are bringing to the table. This knife is competent for the most part. I, I, I don't mean for this whole philosophical debate or idea that I'm presenting to you to be dumped and negatively reflected too much on Medford, <laughs> Greg Medford. I never met the guy. I don't have any personal negative feelings against him. This is him making something that people want. They want this. And so I'm asking for both him to reconsider just appeasing to that and you, who clicked on a random Medford YouTube review and got this deep into it, to maybe reconsider the why behind the what and, and how your little tiny purchase decisions can affect these things. I'm a part of the problem. I bought this knife to just see what's going on. Am I missing it? Because maybe I, I just am assuming it's marketed to this you know, negative kind of perception of knife owners. And lo and behold, my suspicions were confirmed. Now I can speak with a little bit more authority on this, that this t kind of thing I think is taking us back to the past where the general society is going to frown upon us instead of being more inclusive, less tactical, more practical, and, and less mindlessly attached to brands or countries. I think having a more cosmopolitan view is just the correct way to do it logically for being fair and equal and balanced and 
Fox, I guess. What did, what did I just say? So think about these things. This is this is hard stuff to talk about. People want to avoid this stuff. They want to you're being preachy. You're you're doing this, but if we can actually get to a place where we're all unique and different, but we have respect for each other and we understand why we're doing stuff and not just, you know, yay us, boo them, but actually trying to find the correct answer, the correct stance on issues that affect everyone, then we can't get over that hump. We can't change the perception that people have of this community. Pretty deep stuff. Let me know what you, you think in the comments below. I'm expecting some blowback, but at least we're getting the conversation started. I hope this was helpful to you. Have a good one. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.